The NHS is in crisis. You'd have to have lived under a rock somewhere not to have seen some sort of headline saying that, whether it be online or in a TV show. Now, I wanted to get to the bottom of some of these, so I just read them, and they're pretty dire. For example, killing season on NHS wards. Third world A&E. Doctor eats sausage roll during surgery and obesity crisis blamed on NHS. OK, so no sausage rolls are actually eaten in surgery. That's fake news. But you could believe it. They're so damning. So I wanted to go out and ask, what are the real problems? So I spoke to a couple of my friends who work with or for the NHS, and they came up with a couple of themes. First of all, there isn't enough health professionals. There's not enough space or equipment but well, that's really underpinned by the idea that there isn't really enough funding. But on top of that, perhaps there's a problem with the structure of healthcare as a whole. So why don't we look at it? So you're at home and you're feeling ill, you've got the sniffles, you might want to go to see you know, a pharmacist. And, uh, and that doesn't work, so you might go to the GP. And then you might get referred on to the, to the, to the hospital. But 90% of healthcare appointments happen at GP surgery and one in 20 of those are referred on to a hospital. That's a huge number. And most of it is because they just don't have the equipment in a GP surgery to get a diagnosis. 52% of them are sent to hospitals to confirm their diagnosis, and one third, it's simply because they don't have it there, they can't do it. So what if we could develop diagnostic techniques that we could use at a GP surgery, or even at home or in a pharmacy? This is called a point of care diagnostic. And I'm trying to answer this question with nanoscience. Can we develop these with nanoscience? So what is nanoscience? You know, what does it mean? What's nano? So nano comes from nanos in Greek, and it means dwarf. But it's one billionth of a meter. So if you had a nanoparticle or a nanometer, that would be 1 20,000th the width of a human hair. So that's really hard to imagine. So if we look at someone's hand, you've got 10 centimeters. You can see a hand. And you zoom in, and you get down to 100 microns. Now, you can see the edge of independent bits of skin. But this is 100,000 times larger than a nanometer. Now we look here, and you're able to see 10 microns. You've got a white blood cell, 10,000 times larger. We can see a nucleus, 1,000 times larger. And then DNA. We're looking at a 100 nanometer picture, and you can see DNA. One DNA strand is about three nanometers in thickness. So it's still even smaller than that. In fact, if you were to look at the world, I haven't got my marble, I've apparently lost it, um, and you had a marble that was one centimeter in length, the world would be a meter in comparison. That is how small we're talking. Now, Nanoscience isn't a new idea. In fact, it's been around for about 1,600 years, and it's being used by the Romans. Now, they made this cup called the Lycurgus cup. Essentially, it had some nanoparticles in there. And when you shine light on the front of the cup, it looks green. But as you shine light through it, it turns a blood red. Now, this is an example of only one of 50 of the most technically advanced glass that has ever occurred before the modern era. In fact, it was so advanced the conspiracy theorists would use it to say that we've been visited by aliens and we had fancy technology in the past. Now, it miffed scientists for a long time, you know, why is it doing this? And it turns out that it has tiny amounts of gold in there. Now, it's not just tiny, like, flicks of it that's been dusted on. They are 50 nanometers in size. It turns out that different sized particles can affect light in different ways, just by the way they reflect off it. And you can see it here. So at 90 nanometers, it, it sort of looks blue. Now, I am colorblind, so I actually have no idea what color these are. But I think that's blue. And then at 5 nanometers, it's sort of, we call it tea-colored. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Then at 200 nanometers, it's sort of a murky color. And then when we're getting to massive amounts, you can actually see it's pooling at the bottom. It looks like real gold. So can we actually use nanoscience to sort of diagnose or treat a health condition? And there is an example that at least half the audience should definitely be well aware of. But if most of you aren't, I'll, I'll be a bit embarrassed. A pregnancy test. Pregnancy tests you use gold nanoparticles. But before we got there, 
we used to take blood tests. We take your blood, you check if you had a hormone, and that was actually quite a big stress if you think about it. It takes quite a long time for that information to get back to you. But now we have the lateral flow test. Essentially, you just urinate, and the hormones will stick to the gold, but it's still in solution. It pulls them up and boop. You get your second line. Now, who thought that the second line on the pregnancy test was pink just for aesthetic reasons? Well, it's not. It's pink because the gold nanoparticles make it that color. So what does my work have to do with pregnancy tests and sort of old Roman cups? I try to make different shaped nanoparticles. And they come in a huge range, from nano needles to nano cubes to nano cars. Basically, if you can put the word nano in front of it, it probably exists. And on here, these are some of the examples of what are admittedly failed experiments um, of a nano comma up there. And the rest of them are what I call nano nightmares, because they were not meant to look like that. <laughs> now, the idea that I work with is from a company called Cotton Mouton Diagnostic. And they essentially try to use nanoscience to diagnose diseases very quickly. Now, the idea itself isn't original. Again, it's been copied from a huge killer. One that kills 200, well, infects 216 million people a year. And its main sort of target is under fives. We copy malaria. So when malaria gets in your body, you have to get into its mind, right? So it's a killer. We want to we do some sort of CSI chemistry here, get the, the MO. So what is it thinking? It's like, I need food. So it eats something that you're full of. It eats your blood. More specifically, your hemoglobin, which is the oxygen-carrying part of your blood that allow, allows you to breathe. So I want you to imagine that you're looking at a blood cell here. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's bread. That's a plate. And, and yes, you're right. Well, admittedly, it is a nice plate. And it did take me quite a bit of effort to find one without any chips. Now, I want you to imagine that that is actually a red blood cell and a hemoglobin. OK? And you look at it, and you can split the hemoglobin into two parts, the heme group and the globin group, the heme part being iron and the globin being a sort of soft carbon part that the, the parasite likes to eat. So it looks at that. So now you're a malaria parasite, right? You're in the mind of the malaria parasite. And you're like, cool, blimey, I'm hungry. I want a bit of that. But you've got one problem with it. You're like, nah, mate, I'm not having those. Malaria doesn't eat the crusts. It hates it. It leaves it there every time, like a signature. It's a signature of malaria. It is there every single time. So we can use that to tell if malaria is there, right? This is what it actually looks like. They look like nano rods, tiny nano rods that they leave in your body. They're called hemozoin. So what happens is the malaria gets in there, it spits out the iron, and it turns into that. Now, what's really cool about this is because it's made of iron, it's magnetic. So we can do some cool stuff of it. So when they're in the body, they're just randomly orientated facing any way. But if you put a magnet on them, you can make them either face you or face sideways to you. So you've got two different orientations. If you shine light on that, you'll find that when it's facing you, light can get through really easily. You know, it doesn't really care, it's like straight through. But when there's something blocking it, less light gets through. And this is the principle of polarization. You know, when you put polarized sunglasses on, less light reaches your eyes. Great. So if we see this change in light with blood that has been infected by malaria, we know it's there. We know that you have malaria. And this has actually already been diagnosed. I mean, already been turned into a diagnostic test that you can carry in your hand. It's right over 75% of the time. And all you have to do is put a little sample of blood in there and you can see if you've got malaria. Now, 75% you might not think is amazing, but because it's handheld, you can take that to third world countries and you can test people. It's a very time critical disease. As soon as, you, as soon as symptoms start to show, you only have 24 hours sometimes. So it is pretty dire. So this can get you, you know, the help you need fast. So how do we do it for a more complicated disease? Something that is a little bit more intelligent, it eats the crusts, it doesn't leave any evidence for us. We have to imitate nature. So I have to make these rods myself. And there's some examples of the ones I made. I think they're quite good. I'm pretty proud of them. That's three years' work, almost. And, uh, and I mean, I am skipping it. There are some of the failures at the bottom. They, uh, they're not all rods. I quite like the one in the middle. Now, if we get these rods, we can use them to diagnose diseases. So what we do is we get them, but now because we're putting them there, we have to do some extra steps. First of all, we rotate the magnetic field now. 
So if you imagine it's switching between position one and position two. So one, lot of light gets through, two, very little light gets through. It's like a sort of lighthouse pulsing the light. And we can monitor that in a signal. And then we have to take something from the Romans as well. We have to start putting gold on there so we can change the color. This makes it more accurate. So if we stick the gold on there, and you'll see it will like coat nicely, um, you're able to actually see that in a particular area of the spectrum. So if it's blue, depending on the size and so on, you can see it. But also, some diseases are a lot more complicated. They have more than one marker, more than one thing that can point it out to you. So what we can do is we can put multiple metals on and we can look for all of those signals and diagnose complicated diseases. Now, the last bit that we have to do is we have to put on some sort of bioreceptor, something that will actually bond to the marker. And what happens is your marker comes into contact with the bioreceptor. And as you see, when it, when it sticks on there, the weight and the drag of the particle is changing. And it moves slower. So if you look at this point there, on the little signal I put up, you can see that actually the signal changes. And if we can see that change in signal, we can diagnose a disease. Now, if we go back to the picture of the health system, it used to be said that the NHS would struggle in winter, and all the NHS workers would be like, winter is coming, we need to prepare. And then it would have summer to sort of heal and get better. I've heard some people saying that we're now in an eternal winter. Winter is here. So what if we can come up with these diagnostic tests that can stop the 52% of people being referred because they need their diagnosis confirmed? If we could do this, not only could it help us here, but it could help us in third world countries with diseases like sepsis. If you get sepsis, 50% of the people who die from it could have been saved by faster diagnosis. So coming up with these sort of handheld devices that can diagnose you very quickly could in fact save lives. And that is how nanoscience can be a tiny solution to huge problems. Thank you. <laughs>